It is in this part of the story where you might say Solomon begins to hear boss music. You'll notice that for the most part, Solomon's encounters have been pretty routine, and that he only ever faces off against one demon at a time. It does beg the question as to whether Solomon would have had the same luck if all the demons had the sense to rush him simultaneously. Well, whilst we may never know that, at least the demons in this video had the very same idea. The Testament of Solomon refers to them as the 36 spirits, and boy, are they a diverse legion of wickedness. As Solomon tells us, And I commanded another demon to come before me, and there came before my face 36 spirits, their heads shapeless like dogs, but in themselves they were human in form, with faces of asses, faces of oxen, and faces of birds. And I, Solomon, on hearing and seeing them, wondered, and I asked them, and said, Who are you? But they of one accord, with one voice, said, We are the thirty-six elements, the world rulers of this darkness. While Solomon commanded one demon to come before him, he is taken by surprise when thirty-six of them come crawling out of the woodwork. He takes note of their heads as being shapeless, or like that of a dog's, but that they also had the physiology of a human. It is their faces that he details the most, stating that they were like the faces of donkeys, oxen, and even birds. It certainly is a myriad of creatures that present themselves before him, and going by these descriptions, they don't exactly sound like pleasant beings to behold. In fact, given that they have the physical composition as humans, they do sound quite ominous. There are some ideas that these human-like creatures with these animal faces aren't just spirits, but in actuality, a representation of the Egyptian gods, or the false gods, as far as Solomon's god is concerned. You'll notice from Egyptian mythology, many of the gods do have the bodies of men and women, but that they possess the heads of a variety of different animals, many of them being birds, in fact. Of course, this is never specified, and for the most part, we can only assume that these are unrelated spirits. Solomon proceeds to ask who they are here, but to his shock, the 36 spirits are not individual entities, but appear to be one, given that they speak with one shared voice. They also tell him that they are the world rulers of this darkness, and it is this line that is of some importance, and may give us some insight as to who or what these spirits are. It is in the epistle to the Ephesians, which is thought to have been written by Paul the Apostle, where the spiritual battle in the lives of believers is described. Paul seeks to outline the struggles that believers face, and notes that the struggle itself is not against other people nor physical objects, but sin itself. The battle is not one of the physical plane, but one of the spiritual. And you might say that these 36 spirits in the Testament of Solomon represent the conflict, or the enemy, in that very battle. Ephesians 6.12 even uses the same terminology as the 36 spirits, saying, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. In this, Paul identifies the spiritual enemies who could very well be these 36 spirits, these rulers of darkness, that seek to intensify the struggle that believers may have with their faith. In this, Paul implies that this spiritual battle can take place anywhere, and believers should be wary of being attacked at any time. This is quite an interesting contrast with Solomon, who was taken by surprise himself, by the emergence of not one spirit, but 36 of them. In this, we can see that one even as wise as Solomon can be taken unawares, and this furthermore reinforces the need for believers to be cautious. The spirits also appear to view Solomon as inconsequential to their continued existence. They declare, But O King Solomon, thou wilt not wrong us nor imprison us, nor lay command on us. But since the Lord God hath given thee authority over every spirit in the air, and on the earth, and under the earth, therefore we do also present ourselves before thee like the other spirits. From ram and bull, from both twin and crab, lion and virgin, scales and scorpion, archer, goat-horned, water-pourer, and fish. They declare to him that he cannot treat them the way he has treated previous encounters. He cannot wrong them, 
nor can he even hope to imprison them. However, given that God the Almighty has given him authority over every other spirit, they will concede on this occasion, but that they are only doing so because of God, not Solomon himself. Due to this, each spirit ends up revealing himself to Solomon, and Solomon gets to learn the names of each spirit, and what it is that they do. Solomon proceeds to tell us, Then I, Solomon, invoked the name of the Lord's Sabbath, and questioned each in turn as to what was its character, and I bade each one come forward and tell of its actions. Then the first one came forward and said, I am the first deacons of the zodiacal cycle, and I am called the Ram, and with me are these two. This very first spirit reveals its name to Solomon, and declares that it causes the heads of men to become idle, and that it pillages their brows. By this, it means that it causes the minds of men to become vacant, or that it demotivates man so much that man ends up doing nothing with his life. You might link this to the sin of sloth, in that the first spirit seeks to dampen the drive of man by making him idle. He does however also reveal that Archangel Michael is the angel who can be summoned to scare him away. The second spirit declares that his purpose is to bring about migraines to those he haunts, but that he can easily be banished by the mere mention of the Archangel Gabriel. The third spirit appears to harm the eyes of humans, possibly blinding them of good sense, or maybe even physically blinding them and taking away their sight. He, however, like the second spirit, is banished by the mere mention of an angel, in this case, the Archangel Uriel. Interestingly, the fourth spirit appears to be missing from the original text, and so we don't have any information as to what its conversation with Solomon was like, nor what its role was, nor how to banish it. The fifth spirit, meanwhile, brings about blockages to the ears, possibly even ear infections. You might also say that he blocks man from hearing the voice of God, and thus leaves him vulnerable to the mischief of the demons. He also appears, however, to be banished by the mere mention of the Archangel Uriel. The sixth spirit tells us that it attacks the parotid glands, which are glands at the front of each ear, by causing tumours to grow there. He also causes inflammation of the tonsils, but appears to be banished by an entity known as Sabrael, possibly another angel given the suffix. The seventh spirit tells us that it weakens the shoulders of men and causes them to tremble. He also paralyzes the nerves in the hands, possibly a link to some sort of arthritis that the demon can inflict upon those who are susceptible. It also takes responsibility for breaking and bruising bones along the neck and that it sucks out the marrow if left unattended. However, by mentioning the entity Ereal, again perhaps another angel, the seventh spirit flees. The eighth spirit declares that it distorts the hearts and minds of men, possibly a demon that is responsible for confusion or even emotional turbulence. It, like the seventh spirit, will flee upon hearing the name Ereal. The ninth spirit declares that he induces pain in the bowels and claims responsibility for issues with digestion. Yet again, the mentioning of yet another ambiguous angel is enough to seal him away. The tenth spirit declares that he causes the reins to ache, reins as in the straps attached to a horse. However, this could also be a mistranslation, and it could actually be referring to the veins on the wrist. It too is easily dismissed by the mentioning of another lesser known angel. The eleventh spirit tells us that it creates strife, and that it makes wrongs in the homes of men. It isn't clear if this spirit is related at all to Strife, one of the seven sisters that Solomon had encountered earlier, but it's easy to see that this spirit is just as deadly. It also invokes temper upon men, causing them to act out of character, and possibly prone to some kind of domestic violence. The simple utterance of an angel's name is not enough to stop this spirit, however. Instead, it tells us that one must write on seven leaves of laurel the name of the angel which frustrates it, a name it does not reveal to us, mind you. It then tells us that after this, one must wash the laurel leaves in water, and then sprinkle the house with the same water. Only then will it retreat, and relinquish its hold on the violent man, and the strife it has caused. The twelfth spirit tells us that it inspires prejudice 
and delights in causing man to stumble with said prejudices. Some might say that this is a spirit that incites discrimination, and that after stirring such hatred, sits back and watches the chaos unfold as man turns against man. It does tell us though, that if one was to write down the names of the angels that it declares, and wears this paper around their neck or against their ear, then it will leave and cause the incited discrimination to cease. The 13th spirit takes responsibility for afflicting man's mental health, as it declares that it causes nervous illness by its assaults. You might say that this spirit has the ability to affect man on a psychological level, and that it will do whatever it takes to hurt man from the inside. If it hears the name of the entity Adonail, however, again possibly another angel, it will flee. The 14th spirit also takes responsibility for mental health, by stating that it causes torpor as well as shivering fits. It can easily be dispelled however by uttering the name Zorael, another angel perhaps. The 15th spirit declares that it causes cold and frost to build up in the stomach, but can also be dispelled by uttering the name of the angel known as Ajax. The 16th spirit tells us that it inflicts fevers upon men, most of which are harmful and completely incurable. The only way to banish this spirit and the fever is to chop up coriander and smear it on the lips of the victim. Then the following charm must be recited. The fever which is from dirt, I exercise thee by the throne of the Most High God. Retreat from dirt and retreat from the creature fashioned by God. The 17th spirit tells us that it sits on the stomachs of men and causes them to suffer from convulsions. This can take place anywhere, whether the man be relaxing at home or whether he be at work. However, if a certain three names, again, possibly angels, are whispered into the man's ear, then the spirit has no choice but to exit. The 18th spirit, meanwhile, separates wife from husband and seeks to bring about grudges between the two. Like the demon Asmodeus, the 18th spirit seeks to split married couples up and likely does this via any means necessary. It tells us that in order to stop it, the couple must write down the names of their sires and place the paper in the antechamber of the house. From there, the demon is forced to retire. The 19th spirit declares that it sits on the knees of men, possibly causing men injuries to their knees, or possibly impairing the movement of the joint. In order to banish the spirit, the name of an unknown entity must be written on a piece of paper. The 20th spirit, much like the 16th spirit, sends an incurable fever upon men, but if anyone writes on the leaf of a book the names of what are presumably angels, and then ties it around their neck, the spirit will retreat. The 21st spirit declares that it causes children to suffer fits of coughing and makes it difficult for them to breathe. But if anyone is to write the name of another entity on a piece of paper and fasten it around their neck, it too will retire. The 22nd spirit appears to be omitted from the text. The 23rd spirit tells us that it causes the reins to ache, again, possibly like the 10th spirit, and this may actually be referring to the veins or arteries. It also makes it difficult for men and women to urinate, suggesting that it causes complications in the bladder. However, if three ambiguous names are written on a piece of tin and fastened around the loins, then it will disperse. The 24th spirit said that it causes the ribs and lumbic muscles to ache, but that if one was to engrave on copper material, that which had been taken from a ship, which had missed its anchorage, the names of three entities, and then place it around their loins, the spirit would retreat. This one sounds like one of the more complex safeguards against the spirits, as not only does one need to fasten copper around their loins, but also must obtain that copper from a ship that had missed its port. It's unknown why this spirit requires such a specific set of circumstances to repel it. The 25th spirit attacks the entrails with burning sensations and fevers. Upon hearing the names of two entities, however, it retreats. The 26th spirit tells us that he steals away men's minds, changes their hearts, and even makes them toothless. Like some of the others, it's possible that he's able to psychologically and emotionally manipulate people and cause them to act out of character. 
The statement that he can make people toothless also implies that he has some power over the gums, and that he is able to cause decay within the mouth, thus making people's teeth fall out. He can be subdued however by writing another ambiguous name on paper, and tying it around the victim. The 27th spirit says that it makes men consumptive, possibly a wasting disease, and that it causes hemorrhaging. But if it is exercised in sweet smelling and unmixed wine, that which is administered to the victim, then it will at once retreat. The 28th spirit causes insomnia amongst his victims, but that it can be dismissed if one was to write down another ambiguous name and tie it around the temples. The 29th spirit claims that it causes pain in the bladder, but that if one powders into pure oil three seeds of laurel and smears it on the victim, whilst declaring another ambiguous name, the spirit will retreat. The 30th spirit doesn't appear to be conducive of any real threat at all, and simply says that if someone happens to swallow a fish bone when eating, then he must take a bone from the fish and simply cough. This for some reason causes the 30th spirit to flee, not that it appeared to be doing much in the way of harm anyway. The 31st spirit causes lingering disease, but if one was to throw salt that had been rubbed in oil upon the victim, then it will flee after hearing the words Seraphim, Cherubim, help me. The 32nd spirit tells us that it causes paralysis in the muscles, but that it will retreat if it hears the words Adonaiath, help. Adonaiath is possibly again another lesser known angel. The 33rd spirit tells us that it lies among swaddling clothes and in the precipice. It does not detail what its role is other than that, nor does it appear to be particularly threatening. It does tell us though that if anyone writes the word Lycurgos on fig leaves whilst taking away one letter at a time from L to S, then it will retreat once more. The 34th spirit said that it causes grudge and fights, but that it can be frustrated by the Alpha and Omega if it is written down. The 35th spirit declared that it casts the evil eye on every man. By drawing the eye however, it causes much suffering upon the 35th spirit and causes it to retreat. Finally, the 36th spirit declared that it has a grudge against the human body. It tells us that it lays waste to houses and causes flesh to decay. In this, the final spirit seems to be one of the most bloodthirsty, for it seeks to have vengeance against not only man, but everything man builds. Like the others though, it reveals its weakness, as it tells us, if a man write on the front door of his house, Melto, Ardu, Anath, I flee from that place. Having heard all of what the spirits have to say, Solomon tells us, And I Solomon, when I heard this, glorified God of heaven and earth, and I commanded them to fetch water in the temple of God. And I furthermore pray to the Lord God to cause the demons without, that hamper humanity, to be bound and made to approach the temple of God. Some of these demons I condemned to do the heavy work of the construction of the temple of God, Others I shut up in prisons. Others I ordered to wrestle with fire in the making of gold and silver, sitting down by lead and spoon, and to make ready places for the other demons in which they should be confined. So with that out of the way, we then see Solomon glorify God as he usually does, and then we see him command the spirits to fetch water in the temple. We then see him pray to God, and we see that the spirits who lack any sort of humanity are bound to the temple of God, whilst the others are shut up in prisons. Others, Solomon orders to wrestle with fire, and that he forces them to use the flames to forge tools from gold and silver. He also has many of the spirits construct prisons for which to house other demons who are rebellious. Once more, we see Solomon do what he does best in either repurposing the demons or straight up binding them and locking them away. As you can tell from some of the descriptions of the 36 spirits, they sure are a vibrant bunch, and certainly some of the most unique creatures that we've seen in the Testament of Solomon. With that being said, it's safe to say that Solomon has certainly seen some of the darkest, sickest, vilest and scariest demons that the world has to offer, and that he above all people had seen firsthand 
what power the demons could have if there was a life without his god. With this knowledge, Solomon is far more than he was, but you might also say that not even he was strong enough in the end to overcome the deceptions of the demons as we move into the end game of the testament. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.